Wow, what a great day it's been so far. Amen, church? Uh, let's give it up one more time for Sal, incredible communion. Tyler, incredible contribution charge. And then uh, uh, amen to Walt and Ryan with the Amazing Grace song. That was great. Uh, also, a very, very special welcome to a dear sister of mine, Wazira, Corey's mom. It's always great to have her here. Let's give it up, church. Let's be turning over to the book of Hosea. Perhaps more than any other book in the Old Testament, Hosea is a story of God's grace. The prophet's name himself means salvation. One of my favorite groups is you too and uh, one of their songs that's always touched my heart is a song that's simply entitled grace grace she takes the blame she covers the shame removes the stain it could be her name grace it's a name for a girl it's also a thought that could change the world. What once was hurt, what once was friction, what left a mark no longer stings because grace makes beauty out of ugly things. Grace, it's the name for a girl. It's also a thought that could change the world. Here in the book of Hosea, we find one of the greatest of God's prophets. Most likely from the reading of verse 1 of chapter 1, we would understand his ministry goes from about 755 B.C. to about 725. Almost 30 years. And these years were some of the hardest and darkest in all of Israel. Now I think we're all familiar with the fact that by this time, there was a divided kingdom. The northern kingdom is called Israel. The southern kingdom is called Judah. Sadly, the northern kingdom has gone into almost total apostasy from God. And Hosea himself is not only going to preach that message, but he's going to live it out in front of all of Israel. And so we read this in verse 2. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go take to yourself an adulterous wife and children of unfaithfulness, because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery in departing from the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Deblame. Right here we find an incredible challenge given to Hosea. We know from the upcoming passage he wasn't marrying a woman that was already adulterous or already had children, but one that he knew would be unfaithful to him. And so he gets the charge from God to marry this woman, Gomer. Now, some have thought this to be allegorical. Nothing could be further from the truth. This is a real man in a real day. And he himself is going to be grappling with the very things that I believe that we need to grapple with in our generation. So right here, knowing that she someday would be unfaithful, he still marries Gomer. Then we read, And she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. In that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call her Lo Ruhamah, for I will no longer show love to the house of Israel, that I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to the house of Judah, and I will save them, not by the bow or sword or battle, or by horses and horsemen, but by the Lord their God. After she had weaned Lo Ruhamah, Gomer had another son. Then the Lord said, Call him Lo Hami, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. 
We find right here that she has three children, each given a name that's emblematic of where the people of Israel stood with God. Jezreel literally means God scatters. And by giving the name to this, the first son, it meant that God was going to scatter Israel. And this he did in 722 B.C. when the Assyrians literally took all of Israel into captivity. The next was Loruhama, which means not loved. And though we know that God is a patient God, even God has a time when his patience runs out. And so no longer were the Israelites loved by God. Saddest of all is the one that's named Lohami, which means not my people. Most commentators think that this child was not birthed at all by Hosea. She had been adulterous, and so she had a child that was not his. And so it simply means, not my people. Meaning that the Jews of Israel were no longer the people of God. Though they had the outward sign, God no longer considered himself in covenant with them. They were just like the Gentiles. Time passes. And we read chapter 3, verse 1. The Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife again, though she's loved by another, and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods, and love the sacred raisin cakes. Wow! Hard enough to hear you're going to love a woman that is going to be adulterous on you. Now that she's been adulterous and gone after other lovers, God says, I want you to go to her again and get back in covenant relationship with her as her husband. Verse 2. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and list stick of barley. Then I told her, you are to live with me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I will live with you. Wow. When I first went to India in 1982, I was there with two other brothers, and we were being shown around the city of Bombay, now Mumbai, uh, for the very first time. And obviously, the guy taking us around was a total non-Christian. And so he thought, since there were three guys, that we would want to go to the street known as the Street of Cages. The street of cages is where all the prostitutes are literally in cages. And I'll never forget the sense of darkness. It was early evening. And there was a car in front of us also, quote, taking the tour. And someone stood up and then took a flash picture. And I'll never forget just that by all the women in their anger and rage. I've never forgotten it. Right here, perhaps it's a similar scene. Not only has Gomer been adulterous, she has become a prostitute. She is for sale. But now God has told Hosea, you are to go to this woman and to bring her back to you. Of course, that would take a price. Now, interestingly, the price that the scriptures say was paid is 15 shekels of silver and a lipstick and a homer of barley. In actuality, 15 shekels of silver is very little money. This convey, conveys to us that her life in the eyes of the world was worth very little. Even more interesting is the barley sacrifice. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with Numbers chapter 5 about the sacrifice of jealousy, right? Oh, you don't know that one? Well, I'll share it with you then. In Numbers 5, 14, I didn't know this myself. If a man thought that his wife was adulterous, he would have to bring to the priest a sacrifice for her of barley. 
it'd be two quarts. Now, the amount of barley that Hosea brought was 10 bushels of barley, conveying just how adulterous she had been. But the Bible says that he takes her back. And you know, just think about what it would have been like if you were that woman. And out of the clear blue sky, you see your former husband coming. You would have been with the other women, perhaps very scantily clad up front, perhaps in chains. And then you see your husband. The, 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 the shame, the hurt, the pain of what you had given up for your own ungodly pleasure. And then, there wasn't a look of disdain on your former husband's face. But one of joy, perhaps tears, as he handed over the meager price of 15 shekels of silver and all of that barley. And then, they undo the chains. And your husband comes to you and hugs you and says, you are mine again. As long as you never look or be with another man. How would that make you feel? A second chance. That is grace. We read on in verse 4. For the Israelites will live many days without a king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stone, without ephod or idol. Afterwards, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. So the prophecy right here is that the Israelites will become trembling. They're like, they're, they're, they're shook. They're just they're so amazed that God would finally bless them after all of their idolatry. They, in fact, would return by seeking the Lord their God and David, their king. When was it going to happen? In the last days. Let's turn to Acts chapter 2. In Acts 2, we remember the incredible day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes on the 120. A powerful wind. Flames of fire come on the head of each of them. Both symbols of the Spirit. Then they begin to speak in all the languages of the known world. And a crowd gathers. And Peter is their spokesman. And we read in verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Now that is one of the great arguments of Scripture right there. <laughs> it's way too early for these guys to be drunk. It also, though, evidences for them to think that that many people were drunk at nine in the morning just how far away that modern-day Israel was in Acts 2. No, he says, what you see is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Right here, Peter uses the prophecy from the book of Joel. And he says, in the last days, God says, marking that this was the beginning of the last days. Not the last days of, of life on earth, but the last days of the physical kingdom of Israel. Because now, God was going to usher in his spiritual kingdom. Are you with me right here? The last days, in fact, did come in 70 A.D. When Titus, the future emperor of Rome annihilated Jerusalem, killing a million people. We go on though. Peter preaches about Jesus and he concludes in verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel is sure of this God has made this Jesus, whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Well, brothers, what shall we do? 
Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and who all who are far off, for all of whom the Lord our God would call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to the number that day, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. This is the birth of the kingdom. The spiritual kingdom of Israel, we know it as God's church. And right here, this is the fulfillment of the prophecy from Hosea. You see, the prophecy in Hosea said that in time, and it's going to be a long time, Israel will live without a king or a prince. Well, he's talking about a spiritual king. He says, but they will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. Well, David represents the Messiah. The king that they would seek is King Jesus. And all of this would be fulfilled in the last days when God's church would start. You see, in a very real way, Hosea is God and it was conveyed to the Israelites that they were like Gomer. They had committed spiritual adulteries over and over against God to the point that God was going to scatter them. To the point that God's patience had ended. To the point that the covenant was broken and he would look upon them no longer as Jews but as Gentiles. The covenant would be dissolved. But now he says it's all going to change. I am going to come back to you and I am going to ransom you. I am going to redeem you by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so once more, you will be in covenant relationship with me. Does that fire you on up or not? You see, in a very real way, each of us in the crowd today is Gomer. All of us. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know, I don't know about you, but I'm always fired up when I see the Bible coming alive in our day. You know, it's very cool to read all the stuff in the Bible in their day. But I enjoy seeing the Bible come alive in our day, aren't you with me? And I'm just very excited to share with you that the scripture right here in Acts 2, in verse 17, has been fulfilled this week in the West region. It says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. Well, very excitingly, this past Thursday night, a young man on the UCLA basketball team, Josh Thomas, was baptized into Christ. And it took Owa to baptize him. Now, DJ was in the water with him, but it took Owa. We have a vision for this young man. And God has a vision for him. But then, excitingly, on Saturday, I was excited to hear that a slightly older person was baptized. Taryn's grandma, Elizabeth's mom, Alice, 92 years old, was baptized into Christ. (laughs) Young men and young women see visions. Old men and old women have dreams. And I heard the story from both uh, Michael Kirshner and DJ, just the moment. Our now sister, Alice, is pretty much an invalid. And so the brothers and sisters went all the way up to Bakersfield, took her over to the other grandma's house, and literally, DJ and Michael had to lift her up and place her in the water. And she came out of that water a new creation. And some of us, some of us go, wow. But you know, someone had to lift you into the water too. 
And if you're visiting, you need to find some people to lift you into the water. The kingdom is alive. The young and the old come together as one to dream visions of changing the world. You see, when you get down to it, grace changes everything. I have four short charges for you this morning. Number one, grace changes our purpose. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Amen. It's a powerful passage. Paul writes in verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles. Do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And in some respects, that's a, that's a huge understatement. He didn't just persecute the church of God. He killed disciples. He imprisoned disciples. Then he says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. He says, I was a persecutor. I was a murderer. I don't deserve to be called an apostle. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. (laughs) And he says, bottom line, though, his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. You know, the all of them he's referring to is the other apostles. This was no idle boast. He's saying, I appreciate the grace of God so much that I worked harder than all of them. And so we come to a very important understanding. How hard we work to win souls is directly proportional to how much we appreciate the grace of God. Let me run that by you again. How hard we work to win souls, to change this world, is directly proportional to how much we appreciate the grace of God. How much do you appreciate the grace of God? Have you been fruitful this year yet? Have you had visitors out to Bible talk? Are you in studies every week with non-Christians? If not, you have got to look seriously at whether or not you really appreciate the price that was paid to bring you out of your gross adulteries and into the kingdom of light. You know, I, I am just so overwhelmed with thankfulness that the Lord has given us the International College of Christian Ministries. Um, We dreamed about something like this in the old movement and we never pulled it off. And God has given it to us and much of the thanks uh, goes to Tim Kernan and Chris Adams for all of the hard work in in getting this thing to happen. And this past Saturday, a week, we had our very first official class. And in it were what we called the 25 unpaid interns. And it was, it, was, it was a moment. I wish you could have been there. It was a moment. And some have asked, well, how did, how did those 25 get picked? That's what I'm going to tell you. The first thing we look at for someone to be an intern is heart. Their heart for God. Second is their talent. They've got to have some talents that incline them towards ministry. And thirdly, faith. So why is faith so low? Hey, we can give anybody faith. Romans 10, 17 says all you do is you get in the word of God, you obey it, and you'll get faith. <laughs> you know, I love all the brothers and sisters in there, but one stands out to me. Um, he knows he didn't get in there, really, by talent. <laughs> and I say that lovingly. But this young man is all heart, and I love him so much. I'm so proud of him. It's Jason Woody. You know, this young man came into the kingdom in February 2011 
after his sister had fallen away. Very interesting. Colton had been working with them. Colton Roan. And he'd been working with them. And, 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 and Jason moved through the studies fairly quickly. And so they had talked about the fact he's going to be baptized on a Wednesday night. And in the counting cost session on Wednesday afternoon, uh, Colton asked, you know, the fundamental first question, why do you want to be baptized? And though Jason mentioned many things, he never mentioned his gratefulness for the death of Jesus Christ. And Colton just goes, I'm sorry, Jason, we're not going to be able to baptize you tonight. <laughs> why can't you baptize me? Because you don't appreciate the grace of God. And he went away and he thought and prayed and studied and then sat through midweek and talked to Colton afterwards. He says, Colton, I appreciate the grace of God. I love Jesus. I want to become a Christian because Jesus died for me. Colton says, okay, we'll call everybody back. All the cars had left, but then all the cars returned and they had their baptism that night. Is that awesome or not? Now here's the thing, this young man... This, is, is this shows you his heart. No one told him to do this. But on his own, he says, I'm going to be full-time. And so, what did he do to be full-time? Well, he does work a little bit Fridays and Saturdays at Starbucks. But he has gone tagging, and he has gone door-knocking to solicit funds so he can be an intern in the church. So he can use as much time as possible to win souls. You see, he understands that how hard we work and how much time we give is directly proportional to how much we appreciate the grace of God. How hard are you working and how much time are you giving? That's the question of the hour. Grace changes our purpose. What is the purpose of your life? The Bible says in Luke 19.10 that Jesus' purpose was to seek and save the lost. If you really appreciate the grace of God, that's going to be your purpose as well. Yeah. Yeah. Secondly, grace changes our passions. Turn to Titus chapter 2. This is a powerful scripture. Come on, bro. Verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Woo! We can stop right there. But we're not. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Jesus wanted a people yeah. of his own. Yes. That's why he came. That's why he paid our ransom. Grace changes our passions. They may be passions of sexual nature, but it may also be passions of hate and prejudice, even bitterness and impurity. You know, we have today the honor of having one of our dear sisters from the Mexico City Mission team, Sarah McClellan in our presence. This young lady, this young lady went down with the mission team last fall at 19 years old. And she's been fruitful, she's been preaching the word down there. But just about three weeks ago, something very traumatic happened to her. She, like a lot of young people, you know, listens to the iPod with things in her ears, you know. And so, sadly, and she carelessly walked onto the men's section of the metro, the subway, in Mexico City. So they got the men's sections on these subways and the women's section. She carelessly walked into the men's section. She saw that she did it, and then she tried to get out, and then one of the guys grabbed her by the waist and pulled her to the back and then began to do everything ungodly you can imagine. She was sexually assaulted. She's yelling, screaming, kicking, and all the men are just laughing. This goes on for over five minutes. 
the grossness of our society comes. The doors finally pop open, she kicks, and she's out of there. But she's wounded as our sister. She's mad. She's shamed. She's bitter. She's angry. She begins to strongly consider never going back to Mexico City where those gross sinners are at. She said, time to reflect. And I asked if I could share all this with you. And I just asked her this morning, I said, well, sis, how you feel about going to Mexico City Wednesday? I'm fired up, bro. I can't wait to get back and help those people. I put before you that passions such as bitterness and anger and hate rage in our society. Lust, it just dominates the media. Everywhere we look, there's an attempt to grab our attention through a sexual lure. That's right. The grossness of this hour is horrifying. I, when I was a kid, I think I was telling Corey about this. When I was a kid growing up, I, I'd walk a mile to school. As a five-year-old kid, I started first grade. Wow. I'd walk a mile to school with my little lunch bucket. <laughs> and my thermos in it. Yep. All the other little kids would walk in. There are no parents. It, it never would cross our mind that some evil person would grab us. Yeah. The darkness of this hour is horrifying, but we read about it every day on CNN, and we're getting numb to a church. It's time for us to stand up and understand we've got to go out there and change the world. We've got to change our passions. The grace of God allows us to say, no to ungodliness. I don't want any more of that. I want to save you from it. Yes. And it's now my passion yes. to get you to join me in the kingdom of light. <laughs> Point three. Grace changes our financial plans. On, Second Corinthians. <laughs> Remember, grace changes everything. For some of us, we get a financial plan. That's, that's what it means to be in the kingdom. You know, this passage now has greater meaning to me, and I want to share it with you. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that our God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they didn't do as we expected. But they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. To see, the Macedonian churches were very, 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 very poor. And yet... Paul asked for them to give a contribution to the church in Jerusalem. It is really cool to be in a movement, isn't it? Yes. And to help each other out. Yeah. Well, this, this week, I, I received news that brought me to tears. That's so emblematic of the Macedonian churches. You know, our dear DJ and Casey have tried to have a little baby the last couple of years, but have not been able to. And so they very creatively even made a Facebook page where they were soliciting funds for an adoption. And if you haven't seen it, it's, it's a very cool video that, that they made. And though many disciples and others have given them money, they still were falling short. And it takes thousands of dollars for an adoption. Well, lo and behold... Our brothers and sisters in Chennai, India, heard about this dilemma. Totally on their own. No one asked them to. They took up a collection for DJ and Casey's adoption, and they are giving them this week $1,100. Now, you need to understand, 
That's a month worth of contribution for the 60 disciples of the Shinai Church. They changed their financial plans when they saw a need. When they saw their brother and sister hurting in Los Angeles, and they've never even met DJ and Casey. Wow. Except for Raja and Debs. Wow. But they know about them. Yeah. Yeah. We're in the kingdom and we're in the movement together. Yeah. And they go, this couple has not been able to have a child. And they want a child to raise in the Lord. But they're not even getting the money and support either. We'll help. No, no, no. We'll really help. I don't know about you, but at least now I have a little bit of a reason why God has held off a little baby from DJ and Casey. Is he meant for this moment to come where the Chennai brothers and sisters would step up and help them get the adoption. God is always glorified in those things that we think are gloryless. And we need to understand that for our brothers and sisters there that have very little, like the Macedonian churches, they had to change their financial plan. What changed it? The grace of God. Yeah. Let's read back here in 2 Corinthians 8. It says in verse 7, he says, and he's talking to the Corinthian church, who's much richer. Paul says, but just as you excel in everything, in faith, speech, in knowledge, complete earnestness, and love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Yeah. Now, the word grace literally means unmerited favor. Something you don't deserve. And so they were now going to grace the Jerusalem disciples with money to pull them through this time of famine. And so not only do we receive grace, but we give grace. Or they don't deserve it, but they're going to give it and not to do as they expect it because they're going to give first to the Lord and then to us. You know, right now, church... We have what I call in front of us the 2020 challenge. Now, 2020 is what perfect vision is all about. That's when you don't wear glasses, Corey. <laughs> 2020 means you can see it good and you can see it clear. You have, so to speak, clear vision. Well, as a church, we have a clear vision, not just to evangelize the world in this generation, but we want to crank this year, 2013. So to realize our visions of Las Vegas, Denver, Sydney, and Dallas, we've got the 2020 challenge. First of all, starting March 1, we're going to have a pledge drive in the church. It'll last all month. And as disciples, if you're visiting, we, we believe that our, uh, our lives need to be totally open. We're, we're open books. It's no such thing as, you know, it's just, this is my finances or my business. No, 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 no. We're brothers and sisters. You know, I've, I've, I've got three children. They, they share with me their finances. My parents are still alive. I, I share with my mom and dad my finances. You know, smart people are open. <laughs> about their finances because they want to get help. They want to do it the best they can. So in March, we're going to have a pledge drive. We're going to take the whole month. And what we've got to do is we've got to raise our pledges 20% in the church. We've got to go from our present 28300 to 34000 Now, we could do that in many ways. One thought has been all the people that have come in the church the last four years, the campus people would up theirs at least $5. The singles at least 20, and the marrieds, both of them together, 20. We do it that way. But you know, there are many of us that are still not really tithing. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And it's time, it's time to understand the grace of God. It's time to understand that our sacrifice changes other people. You have been graced into the kingdom by people sacrificing so this church could exist. Now, God in his grace, is allowing you the grace to give even more to God. You're not to do it stupidly, but you've got to do it 
with financial planning. That may mean some sacrifices. The second 20 is our 20 times missions contribution on June 30th. Now, for the last couple of years of the church, we've had a 15 times or in April and a 5 times or in November. That makes 20. So what we're going to do is just do it all together one time in June, get it done, and be done with it. Amen? Amen. Now, I, I so appreciate our brother Joe Willis leading the charge here. Now, Joe, Joe, Joe's put on our hearts the concept of plundering the Egyptians. That just feels good to say, doesn't it? Let's plunder the Egyptians. <laughs> And, uh, you know, Joe again is leading the way. I mean, he, he, he has now decided he's going to run a marathon. And he's collecting um, donations for every mile. He's also got some of the other brothers to run with him. Um, ideas have come. I think Corey had the idea of going, or somebody got the idea of going, like, to Applebee's. They don't serve breakfast in the morning, but they're open to any nonprofit group um, going in there in the mornings, and they will make... Uh, pancakes, all you can eat pancakes for the people you bring, and they'll sell it to you for five dollars a person, you can sell it for ten or fifteen. Wow. Um, others have just simply gone to tagging. Of course, the great Chicago church in twelve Saturdays raised thirty nine thousand dollars. <laughs> now, that's that's one way to get the money that we need, but that's just one way. We've also got to come through with our own personal sacrifice, guys. As David said, how can I offer a sacrifice that costs me nothing? And so the challenge is this. Oh, we've got time. I want you to start praying now about the 20% that we're going to go up in March. I know that we can do it, church. I want you to pray now and start putting in the practice plans that we can bust that 20 times contribution at the end of June. Are you with me here, church? The 2020 challenge. Last point. Grace changes our perspective. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Come on, bro. Come on, Verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. Let's just stop right there. The treasure he's talking about is our salvation. Is that awesome? Yes, it is. And then he says, you got it in jars of clay. Now, that's your body. That's your physical body. Now, some of the jars are shaped like this, and others are shaped like that. Some are shaped like that. I don't know what kind of jar you got, but all jars are breakable. That's the point. <laughs> okay? So I just want to encourage you with that now. Here we go again. Let's, let's take a running start. We have this treasure, our salvation, in jars of clay. That's our human bodies. To show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. I love the, the Phillips translation right here. He says, not down, but not knocked out. Verse 10, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death isn't working us, but life is at work in you. He says, we are dying daily, carrying our cross, so that we can give life and salvation to you. Look at this. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. With this same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. He says, we're going to go to heaven and be with Jesus. All of this is for your benefit, so that the grace that's reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Are you not fired up about the ten baptisms this week in the city of Angels Church? to the glory of God. You just, you're hearing about these people being baptized. 92-year-old UCLA basketball players. You just go, this is awesome. This is awesome. This is incredible. Old people, young people, the couple that was baptized in South Central, married people are getting baptized. I mean, it's incredible. Well, let's keep reading then. Verse 16, therefore we 
Don't lose heart. We don't get down. So how many we are wasting away? Yet inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us the eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Everything you can see matters not. It's the unseen that is eternal. Grace changes our perspective. The troubles that we see we have, eh, light, momentary. momentary. Because you see, it's all about the unseen. Salvation. Eternity. Heaven and being with Jesus. That's what it's all about. Doesn't that get you excited? You know, uh, it is awesome to think that we're going to have ten disciples from the L.A. church, mostly in the South region, and five disciples from the Portland church form the Las Vegas mission team. I, and, and, and for Jason and Sarah, it's just awesome. I mean, I think it's just awesome we're finally going to Sin City. I mean, this is, this is what it's all about. Uh, it's awesome. You know, I can't wait till that goes out in April. Then in August is Denver. And uh, it's, it's really cool because the D.C. church is giving to their missions contribution, but the D.C. church, led by the Hardings, and the Denver mission team, led by Jeremiah and Julie Clark, they're going to be doing all the finances themselves while sending out 15 disciples as well. So it's not just L.A. that's doing it, guys. The other churches are beginning to do it. Does that excite you too? Then in December is Sydney, Australia. We're going to turn down under upside down. And Joe and Carrie are going to be awesome. And they're going to steal our heart, though, in Mason and Natalie. They're going to be the campus ministry couple for them. And, uh, you know, with those four, we just need to consider Sydney and Australia evangelized. I mean, that's, that's a good, amen. That's a good four to do. But there'll be ten in all going from the L.A. church. But the one that's got me fascinated is, is Dallas. The Dallas team is to be led by Tyler and Shay Sears. Now, a lot of people were hurting for them when they weren't on the Sao Paulo mission team right after they got married. They go down to Sao Paulo, Brazil, and because of just money challenges, situations, as a newlywed couple, they spent the first month sleeping on a hard floor. And it was tough. It wasn't exactly the dream honeymoon thing that Shay had quite envisioned. <laughs> And it challenged their heart a little bit. But you know what I'm so proud of both of them? Yeah. Is that we're going to have to do Dallas with no money. So what we, we're doing, is, I think it's a pretty cool idea. We're going to start a remnant group ourselves in Dallas this July. And uh, a minister has just been restored in Boston. Tim Power is going to lead it. A family is coming out from D.C. We're going to send a couple from here. And all those people will have jobs. And they'll just be laying aside the money every week, building up a kind of a spiritual war chest right there. And then the mission team, Lord willing, will come in December. Now, it is great that Tyler and Shay were discipled by Raul and Linda to be pretty selfless because it may be the hardwood floor again. But you know something? They, they don't have the same perspective they used to. I mean, these light and momentary troubles, not having a bed, not having money, they're nothing compared to bringing the kingdom of God to Dallas. Is that awesome, guys? Where do you need to change your perspective? Biblically speaking, not having a job is a light and momentary trouble. 
A mom with cancer is a light and momentary trouble. She just needs to be saved. All of the challenges of life, your car not functioning, is but a light and momentary trouble. People who hate you because of your faith is but a light and momentary trouble. Because it's all about the unseen, not the seen. Let's close out in Hosea chapter 1. At the end of chapter 1, when we learned about the three children, about God scattering the Israelites, Jezreel, about God no longer loving the Israelites, the Loruhamah, and that the Israelites were no longer really his children, they were just like Gentiles, lo ami, we then read this in verse 10. Yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called the sons of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel will be reunited, and they will appoint one leader and will come up out of the land for great will be the death of Jezreel. God says there's going to be a time where the number of disciples are going to be countless. There's going to be a time when those people who are not my people, Gentiles like you and me, are going to be called the sons and daughters of the living God. And we are going to gather for that great day. You know, in some respects, I'm kind of surprised I'm here today. Uh, my daughter, Olivia, was supposed to give birth today. But Elena's there in Dallas, keeping watch. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not been uncommon over the last week when, when, when people knew that Olivia's giving birth was imminent for me to get the question, is this your first grandchild? And I, I, I'd pause for a second. And I'd go, well, yes, but really no. Well, what do you mean? Well, it is the first child of my three children that, that's having a birth, a, a, a blood grandchild. It's going to be a little girl. And... Um, that's going to be awesome. But you see, a few months ago, my, my son, Sean, married an amazing young woman, Alex, who had a child out of wedlock when she was a teenager. And that little girl now is 14 years old, and her name is Alicia. And Elena and I love Alicia as our own. Yeah. It, 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 it is, it's the greatest thing, guys to have a, a little 14-year-old girl just be all fired up about you. <laughs> and you just go, oh! And she's the only one in the world that I allow at this point to call me Abuelo Kip. <laughs> now, there will be another individual that'll have that privilege, but... <laughs> and it occurs to me that this is not so unlike what we have studied. Come on. You see... God only had one begotten son, Jesus. The rest of his sons and daughters, all of us, are all adopted. Yep. And you know, here's something that's so amazing to think about. You fire God up. <laughs> just by being his son daughter. I mean, you, just, you do that. Every morning when you hug him, when you talk to him, you fire the Lord up. Yep. He's so proud of you. He loves you so much. He'd do anything for you. He wants to give you the delight of your heart. And so, today, prayerfully we've come to understand from the scriptures that grace changes everything. Yes, it's the name of a girl. It's also a thought that could change the world. Thank you.